Uh, hey, Carl. Um, you know, when we talk, when we look at valuations, I think there's a couple of simple measures to look at. One is something like median market PE, so that you know the median stock in the S&P, and that multiples 16 and a half times forward earnings. Now, it was almost 20 times at the end of 2019. So the stock market, even though we're you know two years or three years really almost past the pandemic start. Uh, the multiples actually declined. And in terms of free cash yield, it's the same story that free cash flow yield on the median stock now is, you know, 5.8%. Um, the 10 years, you know, under 2%. So you're still getting paid a pretty hefty premium to own equity. So I know stocks are kind of in no man's land because of a lot of uncertainty, including the, the war and this sort of surge in inflation. But the fact that the market valuations aren't causing you to have a huge margin of error on the downside means, I mean, I just think you can't really get that hurt if you buy stocks here over the next 12 months. Right. You, you, uh, you're you beginning to spin out a bit of a narrative. I mean, Yellen's on the tape right now talking about whether or not uh, there's a path for further sanctions given uh, the horrible offensive we saw yesterday. Um, it does sound, though, that you're beginning to hear from uh, world leaders uh, the limits of sanctions because of the collateral damage. Am I right? Uh, that's right. Um, I mean, what's pretty apparent now is that the sanctions have caused oil to spike and commodity prices to spike. So it's now delivering a, a pretty big blow to the rest of the world. So even anyone outside the conflict is now paying the price because food and, and energy has gotten expensive. So it, it just shows you the, the sanctions are essentially becoming a game of relative pain. You know, is Russia going to suffer more pain than the rest of the world? But I'm not sure it's a great strategy to actually continue to, in, you know, to add sanctions that cause further inflationary pressures. Hey, Tom, it's Deirdre. Good morning. You've seen a number of hedge funds increase their cash, cash positions. Are you, despite sort of a 7% annualized rate of inflation, is this a smart move for the average investor? Uh, you know, I, I think the foundation for the bull market is still intact. Um, you know, I, I'd say the best sort of arbiter of that is, is the yield curve has been steepening the 10 year versus 30, even the twos versus 10. And if that's the case, then what we're really experiencing, even with inflation, is uh, a spike in commodities that are now working its way through the system. And it's as painful as it is, uh, it isn't. It is very different than being in a secular structural inflation problem. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's painful now. You know, even today's CPI report, as you guys just mentioned, you know, one of the sort of glimmers is that used car prices, which was over half of that rise in CPI last year, is starting to decline. So things that were, you know, viewed as sort of enormous, enormous risk to the market in terms of continuing to add pressure are diminishing. And, and, and that could be the case for CPI really over the next 12 months. So, Tom, do you hold on to more cash? Uh, well, I think we are in uh, a no man's land for the moment. You know, our base case for first half 2022 was uh, that markets would be treacherous. This is far more treacherous than we expected. And I think it's, of course, because, you know, we're in wartime conditions. But do I think stocks will end higher from here on an absolute basis? Yes. I mean, I, I think even though we're at S&P 4200, I think we could still exit this year with 5100 or higher. Hey, Tom, uh, you mentioned CPI. If Bitcoin is an inflation hedge, then why isn't it trading like one? Uh, ja, that's a great question. So uh, there's two ways to answer that. One is, of course, it's not a great hedge because we have inflation. Or the other is Bitcoin doesn't actually see inflation in the U.S. Um, I think that's the... That's what we'll know in 12 months. But it's, of course, been a great inflation hedge for people who live in countries that have had huge devaluations, You know, whether it's the Ukraine, Venezuela, Turkey, even those who own Bitcoin in Russia, they've really been shielded from the devaluation of the currency, which is, which is essentially the core of why, they, why they're seeing inflation. But I guess it'd be even better if they could get dollars. Um, so I, I guess uh, th that being the case, what is your expectation on the role that, that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies play going forward, particularly in light of the executive order that we got yesterday, which of course uh, lays out the questions to be asked more than the answers. Yes, that's right. Uh, I mean, I'd say that the biggest 
I think the most important way to look at this is compare this to five years ago when anyone would have said Bitcoin is, uh, you know, is just a piece of code or just, you know, it's a, it's a bubble or, uh, you know, it's a pure source of speculation. And today it's becoming something that even the U.S. policy Treasury Department has to figure out. I think it just shows you that crypto is, is solving some real problems. And I think the usefulness, especially outside the U.S., is, has actually been proven, especially during this conflict. So I think it's actually ultimately all good things happening. Hey, finally, Tom, um, having done so much uh, good high frequency work on COVID throughout the pandemic, it's amazing how much we are not talking about it uh, lately. I see the CDC is going to devise some guidelines. We might drop masks on public transit next month. Are you putting all of that data work in a drawer or do you expect to revisit it later on? Uh, we're, yeah, it's a great question. I think the best case would be for COVID to disappear. Um, similar to other pandemics. And if that's the case, uh, that would be a great outcome. We're still compiling the data. Um, and I'd say that we'll have a better sense because you know, the, really the last place where COVID is sort of you know, raging is, is actually the Far East. And once that's done, if there's no new variant, you know, we, we could really hopefully just table the whole thing, like you said. <laughs> it would be amazing. Uh, you definitely kept us yeah. uh, so well informed uh, for a couple of years, and we're hoping we don't have to go back to that, that data stuff. Uh, Tom, thanks. We'll talk soon. Tom Lee. Thank you.